Um, does this mic work? Yes, it does. Good. Um, so I came here, I think, just after I'd published my book, um, when 5x15 was just getting going. And if I cast my mind back, my goodness, food waste activism used to be a very lonely place. It consisted of going around the back of supermarkets, rummaging in their bins, and getting journalists to come along to kind of expose the iniquities of the current food system. Um, so the fact that I'm now sitting here with one of anyone in the food world's ultimate heroes in terms of sustainability, gastronomy, and the rest of it, um, it's been a massive journey to go from an issue that back when I started campaigning on food waste was a non-issue, no one talked about it, no one, uh, well, it was literally being slept, swept under the carpets by all the supermarkets. Governments didn't have any policy. It's now more or less impossible to be a food company without um, having policies relating to food waste. We have a UN global goal to halve food waste by 2030, and we have chefs like Dan Barber, um, and in the UK, Jamie Oliver, Hugh Fernley Whittingstall, making the entire series around the issue of food waste. And we have the corporates really on the run. They're changing their policies and reducing waste. Um, so it's been, it's been a nice journey. And it's nice to come back here because it was with Rosie Boycott, who um, was the first person to believe. I'd written this book, OK, 350 pages of tightly argued, lots of facts. So I had written this book. And then I thought the best way of communicating this to a wider public was to organize a massive feast, feed 5,000 people in Trafalgar Square. Obviously, City Hall said, you must be kidding. We're not going to have 5,000 poisoned um, Londoners uh, on our hands. You can't use the square for doing demos like that. Go home and think again. I had lunch with Rosie a couple of weeks later. And thanks to Rosie's heavy artillery fire in the right direction, that no was turned to a yes five weeks before the scheduled date of the event. So. Um, I had to quickly organize it, convince all of my then chef friends uh, this was a great idea. Ten days before the event, we finally got somebody to agree to cook food for 5,000 people. Um, and it was supposed to be a one-off event. It ended up taking over my entire life. What we had realized um, in the course of organizing this event is that pretty much any organization, any individual, any serious figure involved in food on the environment saw this as a colossal opportunity to galvanize public action, not just to tackle food waste itself, but to build a movement globally around the fundamental paradox at the heart of the food system, which is it's our single biggest environmental impact on nature. Food waste is a way of exposing the core problem, which is that we're being told we need to double food production, whereas in fact we already produce enough food for 12 billion people. And what feedback does, it goes around the world. This was um, a trip I did to Peru, exposing just how much of the food we're already producing is going to waste for no good reason. Those were like 1,000 tons of oranges or tangelos being produced in Peru. So cosmetic standards applied to our fruits and vegetables that say they have to look perfect. And um, of course, nature does not produce uniformity and perfection, and therefore, you know, carrots that are literally too long. Can you see these slides, or do we need to dim the light slightly? Carrots that are too long to fit into supermarket packets and get discarded, and uh, green beans get trimmed so that 15 to 20% of the green beans that are grown by farmers in Kenya get discarded just so they fit into supermarket packets. It's a colossal problem, but we need to convert it into a celebratory solution that galvanizes public action and really directs blame where it needs to, to fall. Um, we organize, uh, as, uh, as you've heard, Feeding the 5,000 events. We've now done it in 50 cities worldwide to get um, people together to celebrate the delicious and nutritious solutions to this colossal global problem. We try to make it fun, and we try to make it punchy. We've organized them you know, on pretty much every inhabited continent, launched national campaigns to take on the supermarkets and their policies relating to food waste and have really helped to um, change their, their policies. We get volunteers to go and gather fields, uh, fields full of, of crops that are being wasted and, and give them to charities that feed the hungry. And um, by galvanizing public uh, reaction, by getting media coverage, 
we can put pressure then on the supermarkets to change their policy. So I mentioned the, the trimming of beans. This was an issue we took to Tesco a few years ago. And um, they decided that the waste that they were causing in their supply chain was unacceptable, even to them, and also that the reputational damage that they were going to get for causing waste in Africa and not paying farmers for essentially food that was being grown just wasn't worth uh, uh, you know, carrying on because of the sheer embarrassment that it could cause them. So we got them to agree, first of all, only to trim the beans on one side, and we, got, uh, we felt we'd gone halfway. That by itself saved 30% of, uh, of all of the waste in their supply chains overnight. Um, and then a few months later, they decided not to trim the beans at all. They realized that by not trimming the beans, this extended the shelf life of the beans, and customers preferred it. So it was kind of this totally absurd example of food waste, right like at the pinnacle of absurdity in the overarching paradox of the food system. And you turn it into a kind of win-win edible solution. Um, so there are ways of like making concrete changes to our food system that are not that difficult to achieve and that together we are pretty much obliged to do. Um, I'm going to end on a kind of, uh, before turning to Dan and looking to him for the gastronomic implementation of all of these ideas, um, and, and end by um, just making a point about um, how we can solve this through celebration. Um, back in 2008, I visited a sandwich factory that was wasting 13,000 slices of fresh bread every single day. And I discovered that this was the norm in the sandwich manufacturing industry. All of the crusts, those heels of the loaves, were being thrown away. And inside the first and last slice of each loaf, uh, they were throwing away those crusts. In fact, I stood on this stage and ranted about this very thing several years ago. It's always pissed me off. And I've never got anyone to come up with a crusty sandwich to sell in Eat or, or Pret-a-Manger. Um, all we could do is convince these places to send it off to, to pigs to eat um, as livestock feed. Um, until I met a brewer in Belgium uh, about a year and a half ago who was turning beer, uh, turning bread into beer. And I just thought, this is such an amazing idea. Um, so we, we got a whole load of waste bread. We put a brew on. We got Jamie Oliver to come to the first ever brew. This was the first bottles of what became Toast Ale ever drunk. I had not tasted it myself. We're in the studio with Jamie Oliver on telly. And um, he tasted it. I was obviously sitting there really nervous, thinking, God, is he going to wince in disgust? Um, he said it was blooming good. Um, what's uh, uh, turned from a great idea in, has turned into a great business. We're now collecting tons and tons of perfectly fresh, day fresh bread that would have been wasted, uh, sending it off to a brewer to turn it into toast ale, and 100% of the profits from the sale of toast ale go to Feedback, the charity I founded. So it's a delicious, nutritious way of getting wasted on waste and, <laughs> and solving the world's problems. And, you know, I usually get to the end of the talk and I find that I've forgotten to name the organization I founded or ask anyone to do anything concrete. There is one thing I would like everyone to consider doing. Um, we have a crowdfunder. It was launched three days ago. You can buy future beer and solve the world's food waste problem at the same time by going on to, um, I think it's crowdfunder, you can't see it, .co.uk forward slash raise a toast or just look for Toast Ale Crowdfunder. Buy that beer or, you know, come to dinner with Hugh Fernie Whittingstall or one of the many other things that we're doing. And anyone who's got a ticket to Wasted will also have the opportunity to drink Toast Ale there. I will shut up now and turn to Dan and say, repeat what I said at the beginning, which is what an enormous honor and privilege it is to share a stage with you. Um, and, you know, I remember writing to you before Wasted started saying, Dan, we're coming to the US, we're going to do Feeding the 5000s across the country. You are our number one hero chef. Please, will you get involved in food waste? And a couple of months later, you wrote back and said, I'm sorting out this little thing in New York called Wasted. And my God, the coverage that Dan got and the inspiration he's given to literally dozens and dozens of other chefs now in the US around the world. So thank you so much for coming to London. How are you finding it?
I think I, I'm here in London in part because of Tristan, even though I, I've only just recently met him. We, we, um, Blue Hill is the restaurant that I'm the chef for. My, my brother who's in the audience, my brother is a co-owner. Uh, he and I opened with our sister-in-law who's the designer. We like to keep everything in the family. Um, we, we decided to turn one of our, we have two restaurants in New York, one in the, in the West Village and one that's located on, a, on an old farm just outside of the city. We decided to, to turn one of the restaurants, the, the one in the middle of the West Village, this old speakeasy into a, into a pop-up that was devoted to food waste. Shut down the restaurant and reopen it the next day, reimagined as a restaurant that, that offered a menu of food items that had been intercepted on their way to the garbage can or, or the compost pile. Uh, we got that motivation and the confidence to do it. Actually, we didn't have a lot of confidence going into it, but we had so, some degree of confidence. And if anything, it was based on the work that people like Tristan are doing. And, and, and in particular, Tristan, because it, his work has reverberated around the world and certainly in the United States, where I consider the issue of food waste to be quite a bit behind what has penetrated the consciousness of the UK. So this is all a run up to uh, introducing really the idea of food waste from a culinary, from a gastronomic point of view in New York and the US. And we had no idea the power of that message. I mean, we captured maybe at the right moment the zeitgeist and, and did quite well. And then there were lines around the block and, and people waiting for a chance to taste waste. Uh, we found that very interesting. Um, we also did it in a context of, of real pleasure and delight and that we weren't, we weren't pontificating or admonestering the, the, the wastefulness of the everyday American. We were actually celebrating what was left over. And I think that might have been the ticket to some of the success. The other part of it is that we involve chefs every night. Every chef from um, around New York City came to participate with a daily special. And uh, they introduced their dishes based on imagining this food waste. Interestingly, uh, as I thought, but I was reinforced with this idea, is that these chefs came with dishes that, that they are already serving on their menus. And what, what became apparent, and though what I had already suspected, and part of the reason of launching this pop-up in New York City, was that I wanted to show off what chefs do every day, wear on our sleeve, uh, what is a part of our menus. We just don't call it out. I just got off the phone when I, when I was on my way here talking about a special that we're running tonight at Blue Hill, New York. And the chef was talking about some off cuts of, of lamb that were left over from the night before and some winter vegetables that didn't make the, the cuts of, the, of, a, of a menu special we did on Sunday. And uh, tonight's special is a braised lamb ravioli with winter vegetables. That's what we're calling it. Could just call it wasted. <laughs> so part of the reason for launching the, the, the pop-up was to wear on our sleeve what we do every day. And I wanted chefs to be a part of that because I don't consider myself to be an originator of this idea. In fact, I think chefs do it well and, and, and better than, than Blue Hill does uh, throughout New York and throughout the world. And that had a kind of kinetic energy to it because chefs were so impassioned by being free of announcing that they were utilizing waste. And of course, it, it showed off a, a creativity, a sense of craft. Because really what goes into the best kind of cooking is the transformative powers. You ask a chef if they'd rather cook a steak or an oxtail, 100% of them will say an oxtail because that utilizes the craft and the ingenuity and the discipline of cooking. And that too raised an issue for us, which was in this, in this problem, this daunting problem of food waste. Tristan mentioned one third of everything that's produced is wasted. Can we look to gastronomy? to chefs, to restaurants, as not just places of enjoyment and escape from our everyday worlds, but actually of, of, of uh, answers to this daunting problem. Can we look at menus as places that connect to this issue in ways that uh, are celebratory and delicious? And so what's up on the screen is one of the dishes that actually have transported to London. Um, we got a call from Selfridges 
We got a call actually from all over the world, which now that I said that sounds very Trumpian. Uh, but I don't mean it that way. Uh, we said no to everybody. That actually also sounds Trumpian. But I, <laughs> it was Selfridges that called them, and almost immediately we, we recognized that there was an opportunity here on the, on the top floor overlooking London. And below us, the fashion, the, the fashions being displayed, what, what is fashionable, what will be fashionable, will become uh, uh, necessary to be wearing next year or the year after. And we thought, well, why, wouldn't it be great to have a restaurant that was sitting on top of that? Not just the optics of looking over London, but also having below us a place where fashion was being introduced, where outliers would become mainstream, where the avant-garde would become, would bleed into the culture. That's with fashion, but can't restaurants serve that same purpose? So one example from New York that we've reinterpreted for you in London is this vegetable pulp cheeseburger. I, I'm staying at a hotel just three blocks from Selfridges, and every morning I walk to Selfridges and I pass four juiceries. So I'm heartened to know that, that the same kind of craze for juices in the morning is happening here as it's happening in New York. And what we did is asked each of the juiceries, what do you do with all the fiber that's left over in the juice, in the, in the, in the, in the juice machine? And all four of them said nothing. We throw it away. So we collected it and we made it into this burger that you're looking at behind us. Uh, with all the beet juice, it turns out that when you bite into this burger, it's bloody rare. And we grill it and it takes on some of the Anami of, of, a, of, a, of a beef burger. We've, we're serving it on a bun that's actually an old stale hamburger bun that we've repurposed uh, by adding a little bit of milk and water and a little bit of yeast. And it's a beautiful repurposed hamburger bun. The cheese is from Neil's Yard Dairy of just rejected scraps of cheese um, that are perfectly delicious. We melt it onto the patty. The, uh, the ketchup it's actually from Tesco. It's the, the leftover juice from their cutting of all their beets in their, their vegetable processing center. And they've captured the juice for us. And we've taken big vats of juice and reduced it down until the, gelat the, the natural gelatin of the beet thickens to a, to a ketchup. We've done very little else, although people think we've added 100 different ingredients. It is, it is simply beets reduced, beet wasted beet juice reduced. There's a picture here of, of cow corn. We serve that in New York because we really wanted to talk, we wanted to take this issue, this, this, this phenomenon of the juice craze, and yes, talk about, have we ever thought about what happens uh, to the leftovers of our, of our morning juice? But we also wanted to talk about the larger issue, which is the hamburgers, and what goes to feed the cows that feed us the hamburgers. And, and that, of course, traces back to corn. There's 120 million acres of corn in the United States grown. Uh, we eat directly about 2% of that. 60% uh, of it goes to feed animals. About 30% goes to either ethanol or to, to sugars, plastics. And it seemed to us, all of a sudden, that well, couldn't the issue of food waste be expanded a bit from ugly fruits and vegetables and throwaway items at the supermarket to pointing the figure at something that's very hard to talk about, really, which is our diets, our everyday diets. If we are eating protein-centric plates of food, we are, by definition, creating a ton of waste. And that, that dwarfs anything that's really talked about, at least in America, in the everyday press. The ugly fruits and vegetables, the expired dairy, the leftover things on your plate, those are all just low-hanging food. They're tiny nibblings. In the much bigger picture, of how can we change the culture of our food diets and cut down on food waste. Because when you're feeding 120 million acres of corn through an animal to us, it's extremely inefficient. Now here in the UK, you don't do that. But you do something just as bad, which is you have about 2 million hectares of wheat and you feed about 60% of that to animals, 65% almost, to animals. The rest of it goes to bread. But that 65% that go to animals is as inefficient as feeding 120 million acres of corn. 
can't compare the geographics of the United States to the island of, of the UK, but, but you can say that the system is insane, uh, especially when we're concerned about feeding a growing population and doing it deliciously. So this juice pulp burger, even though it was a response to an immediate fad and to ask a question, should we be drinking so much juice? Or if we're drinking so much juice, should we not be thinking about how to use the fiber that comes off of that? The furthering of the question is to say, should we really think about the patterns of eating our diets? I wrote this book called The Third Plate. Put a, put a plug in for my book there before I finish. Uh, my publisher asked me to, www.thirdplate.com. Uh, it, it's downstairs it, it, for sale. Yeah. It, it was really a wake-up call to me to study, for, as I wrote the book, that cuisines around the world have done just what I'm talking about. They've soaked up waste through their, through their cuisines. Through their, you've done it in Great Britain. Haggies, shepherd's pie, blood sausage, bubble and squeak, uh, all of which we've hoped to, to reinterpret without offending uh, you all uh, in the wasted menu because they are based on waste, as, as every cuisine is based on peasantry and this negotiation with the landscape of how do you utilize what the soil will produce and do it deliciously and nutritiously. As I said to my cooks yesterday, the Japanese uh, grow, eat a ton of white rice. Uh, the rotation into white rice is buckwheat in most of Japan. Uh, breaks up disease cycles and allows you to have a very good harvest of, of rice. The Japanese did not take buckwheat as we do in the United States and feed it to dog food. They created soba noodles. And so to be Japanese is to not just eat white rice, it's to eat soba noodles. Uh, and that, I think, is the challenge for the future from a gastronomic point of view, is how do we create a template? How do we create dishes? That becomes so iconic, that bleeds so seamlessly into the culture that you don't have to have a wasted pro project on the rooftop of Selfridges. But instead, uh, it becomes a norm, a part of our everyday diets that help reshift uh, this focus away from food waste to a celebration of great food. With that, I'll turn it back to you. Dan, I think we've got 20 seconds left. I do oh, have a shoot. burning I'm question. I'm so sorry. No, no, that's, you've done that's it. That's the you most just champion it. of me. I just, just sucked up it. all the oxygen. I, I have one burning question for you, which is, is food waste Trump-proof? <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, at a time when you, when you launched Wasted, it was the zeitgeist. It got huge, huge uh, attention. It made its point 100 times over. In the present political climate, is food waste one of the few things that we can continue to make advances on? Or well, you're going to have go to out? tell me because I feel in many ways you started this thing. So you're, what is the next chapter of, of where we go? And then I'm going to sort of copy you and try and move it forward. <laughs> that's, that's a great challenge. I think it's all in the chips, Dan. I think we've used food waste as a window to open up this, the core paradox, the waste, the absurdity of the way in which we use our land and our resources. And it's about giving everyone a way to eat their way out of what is one of the world's biggest problems and turn the food system into our biggest tool for tackling them. That's what the third plate's all about, and we've just got to carry on that path, I well, think. Well, thank you for inspiring me to be here in the UK and for all that you've done to inspire this movement around the world. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel very sorry for everyone who isn't going to taste, taste your message because you are a beautiful speaker, presenter of the whole idea. Nothing compares to actually eating this man's food, which I've done in New York, and I look forward to doing it in London. Um, so I'm massively grateful to you. Hands up, who's got a ticket for Wasted? A few lucky, a few lucky individuals. You need to come back again. You need to come back again, Dan, for Wasted 2. Thank you. Thank you. I love it here. Thank you. Thank you.